So you know what that means. Stick around and do the whole thing to a blank audience. Yeah. <clears throat> Again. Okay. Now, are we recording? Yes, we're recording. Okay. <clears throat> this is our last chapter. Chapter nine. And the focus of this chapter is going to be on covalent bonding. We introduced general concepts of bonding in the last chapter. And we're going to tie into the last chapter with this one, starting and continuing with the localized electron model. But this will be our last exam, and we'll have it on see, the 9th of December. So that means we'll come back on the second and have a review. So that means you got the whole Thanksgiving holiday to either blow it off or study in small increments. Is it on No, next week is Thanksgiving break. Yeah. Uh, you come if you want to. It's not going to be anybody here. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, another thing you'll notice is uh, while you were taking the exam, I went through the PowerPoints and added some things that I thought might clarify points. Uh, but I will take the modified version and put it on Blackboard if you want to get a copy of it later. All right. So the uh, localized electron model if we apply it to the methane molecule, uh, and what we've learned so far would be what? We say that then you draw your Lewis dot structure. Right? So that's um, four. Yeah, four and four is eight. Two, four, six, eight. So that's everything. And uh, VSEPR says four groups makes tetrahedral, right? Now that's good as far as it goes. But in order for the model to explain these angles, each one of these bonds would have to be equivalent in order to produce a tetrahedral structure. Well, the localized electron model says that electrons belong to atoms. And the only way you get a bond is to overlap orbitals from one to the other. So that means the orbitals that overlap from this carbon to that hydrogen would have to be exactly the same as this one, that one, and that one. Okay? But if you draw the, the electronic structure of carbon, um, right. What are the valence electrons here? These four, right? Two of them are in s orbitals and two of them are in p orbitals, right? So that means that these two are not the same as those two. That means we've got a problem because we can't claim tetrahedral structure based on the orbital structure of carbon. So what do we do when the model fails? Remember, we got three options, right? We can either toss it out and restrict its use, or you can modify it. So the choice that's been made for this one is to modify it. And the, the, the modification is called hybridization. So we take these, uh, this orbital and those, as many of these as we need, and hybridize them. Okay. So there's the orbitals that we have to play with. And then I've just explained why. You can't because the s orbitals are spherical, p orbitals are dumbbell shaped. They're not equivalent. <clears throat> so here's our hy hybridization 
Um, so what we do is we take uh, how many S orbitals can you have? Just one, right? And how many P's can you have? Three. Right? So if we take an S orbital and um, three P's and mix them together, and we come out with equivalent orbitals. So how many do you have? Well, hybridization says that you got to have the same number of hybrid orbitals come out the mixer as you put in. So if we put one of these in, three of those in, we have to have four of these come out. So that's good. Now they're equivalent orbitals, only they're not the same shape. Or um, uh, they we can't assign them a uh, a neat atomic electron structure, right? We've got something different now to deal with. <clears throat> but if we have those four equivalents, now we can create a tetrahedral by overlapping these four, one of each, with each of the S orbitals for the hydrogen. So that's what hybridization means. So it just depends on how many you need as to how you hybridize. In this case, we need all four. We need that one and all three of those because we've got four electrons that have to be shared with four hydrogens to give you four bonds. And if you look at them on a, an energy diagram, you see that the energy level for the hybridized orbitals is somewhere in between. Right. S orbitals are lower energy than P's, and the SP3s would be somewhere in between. Okay, this is what we start with, these four, the S orbital and three P's for the carbon atom. And uh, these are the hybridized orbitals. So they do this mathematically. This is generated, <clears throat> not observed. And you get these uh, four different directions, but they're equivalent uh, in so far as they uh, point to the apexes of a tetrahedron. And then you can you can go back to the localized electron model and just overlap those orbitals with the s orbitals of hydrogen. And you've got your structure. Okay. That makes sense so far. Okay. So let's try it with a different one. I think this probably is not in your um, in the printout that I gave you. This is something I've added. So let's say we want to describe the, the uh, bonding of an ammonia. So nitrogen has five, hydrogen has three, so that's eight. So we have um, uh, nitrogen. Put all hydrogens around there, two, four, six. We have two electrons left over, and you know they go here. Okay. So if we count up with the BSEPR model, four of them give us a tetrahedral electronic structure. So we have um, there's our tetrahedron like that, you know, like that <clears throat> electronic structure, and we have the um, trigonal pyramid would be our molecular structure. Let me just cover up that next one's left. Okay, so so far. We already know that, we've done that. But uh, what does nitrogen have to work with? Right, so we have seven. 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 2, 4, 3. Okay, so we've got um, five electrons from nitrogen, but we've also got three from hydrogen. So we're going to need uh, five plus three is eight electrons. And that 
means we need to divide that by two, we need four orbitals to overlap. Right? So uh, nitrogen is a similar case in hybridization terms to methane. We need four of those. <clears throat> so we're going to have an sp3 orbital, four of them. Three of them are going to be used for bonds, and one of them is going to be used for the lone pair. Okay. Now that's where it gets kind of, anytime you try to make a fix, there are unintended consequences. Okay. So the shape of uh, the uh, electron distrib distribution for these three orbitals is one shape, and then the shape for that orbital for the lone pair is a different shape. Right, because it's got nothing constraining it. It's got no, no atom up here to constrain that lone pair, so they just tend to balloon it out. That's what I mean by um, the theory says they're equivalent, but in actuality, that orbital is, is a little bit uh, bulbous. Okay. But that's just to demonstrate that anytime you try to fix something, there are unintended consequences and you just have to deal with it. And that's, that's the way theories are. If you try to fix them, there's always something uh, over here that you don't think about and you got to deal with it later. Sometimes you just, you just turn a blind eye, <laughs> right? <laughs> Until somebody says something, you try to submit a publication for review and uh, one or more reviewers come up and says, whoa, 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 you can't do that. So, not based on the theory you're espousing. So then you have to deal with it. But for now, <clears throat> we're saying uh, these hybridized orbitals are equivalent for methane or for ammonia. And that gives you the tetrahedral shape uh, without having to use atomic overlaps. Now we have the hybridized orbitals overlap. Where you need them, right? And then that's the leftover one. Okay. So that's everything that we just talked about. And there's your lone pair in that one sp3 orbital. And one thing that hasn't changed is whenever we talk about um, using the localized electron model and the VSEPR subpart to define the shape. Um, this is all based on one central atom. So if you have a big molecule, the shape around this atom might be one, shape around this one might be different. We're just, we're just using simple atoms now so that we don't get confused with all these others, but recognize that um, if you have a large molecule, it could be shape, one shape here, different shape there, different shape there. And using hybridization, it would be a different hybridization, of course. Okay. Um, oh, now ethylene. How do we deal with ethylene? So what is ethylene? All right. Well, they've kindly given us the formula. So if we want to draw that shape, we need um, eight here and four there, which equals 12 electrons. Right? And we have the carbons bound to each other and we have the uh, hydrogens like that. So there's four hydrogens, two carbons. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10. So we got two electrons left over. Hydrogens can't accept them right, because they don't have a place for it. So we have to put them on one of the carbons. Right? So that gives you an octet for this carbon, but you don't have one for that one. All right, so you just take that one, put it into the bond, and now you have an octet for everybody. Okay, so that's old school. The last chapter so far. All right, so now what do we do? Well, if we've got 
if we use the VSEPR model, we've got one, two, three groups, which means trigonal plate right around that carbon. That'd be the same for this one. So if we solve this one, then we've solved the other one. So the trigonal planar says what? You need three equivalent orbitals, right? To make the trigonal planar. So maybe I've got a picture of this. Um, all right, we're getting ahead of things. I thought I had a picture first, but I don't. So trigonal planar means that we need three equivalent orbitals. But we go back. So, so for yes, huh? For yes, P. Okay, you've got your carbon. And we're starting off with the same thing. Um, 2s2, 2p2. Uh, so the carbon has that many. But how many p's do we need to hybridize with s's to give us three equivalents? If we need three equivalents and you start off with a certain number, right? you start off with one S and two P's, then you have potential for three equivalents. So one S and uh, two P's. Yeah. The um, the symbology here is kind of messing with us because if we say sp2, you might think that's two electrons, but it's really two p's. So maybe I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's put them. Let's put them down here for now. It's a little different than the slide, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is avoid the mix-up of number of orbitals versus number of electrons. So we have two p's and one s. Mix them together, and you get three equivalent orbitals. So that gives you one, two, three. Okay. okay, so what's left over? We've got an unused p orbital, don't we? Right? So the sp2 hybridized orbital give us this with that other carbon. Right? But you've got an unused p here. On both of them because they're equivalent. Okay. So you've got your sp2s. Get to my plan here. sp2 and sp2 with an unused p. <laughs> so maybe we use px and py. The pz is left over. Okay. So what happens to that? Well, these p's overlap. And that's where you get that bond, that bond right there. Okay. These bonds are on axis between the atoms. They're called sigma bonds. Okay. Anything that's off axis is a pi bond. So these two overlap. Actually, they overlap above and below, but they only produce one extra bond. And that's a pi bond. It's in the notes. I'm just, I'm just stream of consciousness. So what we've done is we've hybridized one S and two P's to give us three equivalent orbitals, and that makes trigonal planar. And then with the leftover P orbital still has electrons in it. Right? So they need to overlap as well. You can't just leave them out there. Right? We could under certain circumstances, but in this case, what we've done is we've overlapped those unused P's to make a pi bond. So even with that pi bond in there, we still need these sp2 hybridized orbitals in order to give us our equivalent, our three equivalents. Okay. Um, and this is what the energy looks like. For the sp2s, of course, it's going to be somewhere between P's and S's. But that 1p orbital is still the same energy. It was not hybridized. So this is another way of looking at it. So here are our three equivalent sp2s. 
and there's our unused P orbital. And that's what the hybridization looks like. Oops. Not yet. There we go. So there you get the P orbitals overlapping to give you the uh, that pi bond. Okay. Pi bond. An sp2 hybrid orbital orbital on one CH2 unit bit of ethylene overlaps with an sp carbon double bond in ethylene consists of a sigma and a pi bond. An sp2 hybrid orbital on one CH2 unit of ethylene overlaps with an sp2 hybrid orbital on the other CH2 unit to form the carbon carbon sigma bond. Now we use a side-on view to show how the remaining unhybridized p orbitals on each CH2 unit overlap to form the carbon-carbon pi bond. Okay, so the natural <coughs> test question would be, how many sigma bonds can you have between two atoms? How many axes are there between two atoms? One, right? You can only have one sigma bond between two atoms. That's it. But you can have more than one pi bond overlap. Because most pi bonds, not all of them, but for general chemistry, um, our overlap bonds would be uh, formed from unused pi's. So, so suppose we only used one pi to hybridize. That means we'd have two extra. So those two could form two more pies, and that would give you a triple bond. We're, we're going to look at that next. Oops, we take control. There we go. Well, maybe not next. <laughs> we have one more example. <clears throat> Carbon dioxide. So we had the ethylene was um, fairly easy to deal with because we had two carbons that were equivalent. So if we solved one, we solved the other. Here we have one carbon bonded with two oxygens. That's very difficult to see and it'll keep it dark. until that one runs out. Okay, so um, we've got um, one carbon and two oxygens, which two times six is 12, right? 16 electrons. Okay, so we do carbon in the middle and we put our oxygens out here, so that's two, four. We've got 12 electrons left over. So we go two, four, six, two, that's 12 electrons and we're done. Now we have to uh, find the octets. Right? So carbon doesn't have any extra to do anything with. It. So what we can do is take these two, take these two, right? So that gives us there, there. Now we've got octets for all of our atoms. So that's our Lewis dot structure. And then we look at the central atom and say how many electron groups are around it. Two electron groups means linear. So this is linear. Now, <clears throat> with this carbon, it's going to be bonding with that oxygen and this oxygen. So how many orbitals does it need? It needs one on this side and one on that side, right? Okay. So that's sp hybridized. Should be. So what does that leave us? Well, that leaves, uh, we have two sps 
and then we have two unused peaks on carbon. Right? We haven't talked about oxygen yet. We're focused on carbon. So that means we've got one for this oxygen and one for that oxygen that are sp. So here's one sp, here's the other sp, and this oxygen overlaps with this one, whatever they happen to be. We haven't described them yet. Uh, so now we have we have this unused peak, and then there's another one that comes in and out of the board. So what happens there? Well, it just so happens that this oxygen has an unused P, and that one has an unused P. So this one can overlap with that one, and this one can overlap with this one. Okay. So you can create uh, two sigma bonds, one on either side, with the SP, and then the two unused P's make a pi bond on that side and a pi bond on that side, and that gives you uh, this Lewis dot structure in orbital terms. Now, if we look at the oxygen to see, all right, let's prove, we got to prove that that oxygen has an unused P orbital that can overlap with the carbons. Right? If that's not true, then our whole theory falls apart. So, if we look at the oxygen and we say, um, Around the oxygen atom, we've got one, two, three. Right? So that's trigonal planar. So trigonal planar means we need three sp2s. Two p's, one s gives you three equivalents. So the oxygen is sp2 hybridized with uh, one sp2 on axis, making a sigma bond with the carbon. And then the other two with lone pairs, right? So you've got this one sp2, and then you've got this one and this one. They're all equivalent with trigonal planar, but these two have lone pairs in. Okay. So, um, well, actually, then you have an unused p here. So that's a p orbital. And you've got a pair in that orbital too, because we just donated it to carbon for that bond. So there's your unused P's. These are your trigonal planers. Uh, and these overlap with the unused, with the orbitals on carbon. The way we described it, the, the carbon doesn't have any to donate. So we get all of them from oxygen. And that is not necessarily true. That's an artifact of the BSEPR model, where we start from the outside and work in. Localized electron says, electrons belong to atoms. So we're saying they belong to oxygen to start with, but eh, maybe not. No, maybe, actually when the process happens, um, this is our understanding of it. This is the way we rationalize what's happening. But in effect, um, you've got four electrons donated from carbon. So one, two, and then there are two others that are donated. So it's not like two are coming over from here, it's like one from there and one from there. Right? So it can get kind of messy. Right? Just learn how to use the, the model. Um, okay, so um, oxygen is sp2 hybridized, carbon is sp hybridized, and then the pi bonds are formed from unused p orbitals. Okay, and the bond angles, of course, are 180 degrees. That doesn't change in the model. And there are two sp's, or in between energies, and the unused. Uh, p orbitals are at the same level as they were before. Okay, so that's another way of looking at it.
Dynamic. Oh, we've got lab that we can bleed into today. We don't have a lab. Is what I'm <laughs> Sorry, don't panic. <clears throat> right. In fact, we don't have any more labs, do we? No, we're done, except for the reports. <clears throat> so we've got all this extra lab time that we can use for to take our time. Try to understand this stuff because this is this is pretty involved and heavy stuff. I mean, when you think about where we started, which is I mean, learning the symbols. Now we're talking about orbitals. Okay, so uh, what does nitrogen look like? Well, the Lewis dot structure is that. Uh, you can work it out yourself if you want. <clears throat> but what we've done is, um, around this nitrogen, we have one, two groups. So that's linear. Right? And we need two orbitals to do that. So we've got sp hybridized. Right? And that means we have uh, two unused p orbitals. Right? So one of them on this one overlaps with one on that one and gives you one pi bond. And the other unused one gives you the other pi bond. So it's similar to carbon dioxide, except that um, you don't have any um, outriggers that you have to deal with. The only outsides you have are the lone pairs. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's what it would look like, overlapping orbitals. You have one sigma in between with the sp hybridized orbital, and then you have overlapping unused p's to get to the other two pi bonds. As a general rule, um, I've never seen any molecules with more than one sigma and two pi's. I suppose that you know we could probably dig up some research papers where you know, four pies, no, three pies <laughs> would have been created, but those are exotic. In the natural world, <laughs> you don't see it. So you really only have to deal with one sigma and then one met pi or maybe two pies. Okay, so um, Let's keep going. We're not done hybridizing yet. We've done sp3s, sp2s, and sps. What about PCL5? What do we get when we do PCL5? So phosphorus is uh, 5, and then set, uh, 7 times 5 is 35, so we have 40 electrons. Okay, so we put P in the middle, like that. The chlorine's around here, like that. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, the 30 electrons. And what we have here, the room around here for the chlorines is we have uh, 2, 4, available 6 to give us an octet. So 6 times 5 is 30. So if we just do 6 around each one, we've got all of our electrons counted. So now that we have um, uh, five groups around the phosphorus, that is trigonal bipyramidal. Bipyramidal. Which means we've got a triangle in the middle, a phosphorus there, and we've got a chlorine up here, and chlorine down here. Chlorine in the back, chlorine. There, there, there. And we need five equivalent orbitals right? in order to make that valid structure. So we need five equivalent hybridized orbitals. Where are we going to 
again. Well, we use up one S and three P's, that only gives us four. But where do we get the fifth one? You're about to say it. D, okay, go to D's. D, S, P, three. That'll be consistent. Three. D, S, P, three. That'll give you five equivalent orbitals. Can we do that around phosphorus? All right, where's phosphorus? That's right here in the third period. So it, it has access to three, three S, three P, three D. So yes, we can use D orbitals for phosphorus. And we can hybridize them into five DSP3. Okay. And that's the end of the story. Don't need any high bonds. They're all sigmas. And then, of course, the, the bond angles are um, I think we added one to that before, didn't we? Because we use this as the uh, as the fulcrum. Right. That's 180 degrees around that piece. Um, between here and and here, between here and here, what do we do that? That, that, and that. There, there, there. That's a right angle, so that's 90 degrees. And then each one of these is 120 degrees because they're on an equilateral triangle. It's three times 120 is 360. So we actually have three angles 90, 120, and 180. You want to be technical about it. So DSP3. Now, why don't we say SP3D because D came last? And, you know, it's, it doesn't sound right to somebody's ear. So we say DSP3. <clears throat> and there's your uh, orbital overlaps. How about this one? Okay. Xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon is a noble gas. And we get the bond with stuff. Force it, right? You can't get helium neon to bond with anything. I think they've made maybe one or two compounds with argon. But the farther down you go, the easier it is to, to, to force a bond because you're getting farther away from the nucleus. Things are kind of spread out. Mushier. To use a technical term. Okay, so. Uh, this is 8, right? And that's 28. So we have 36 electrons. And if we do phenom in the middle with all our fluorines, okay? So that's 2, 4, 6, 8. 28. All right. So we got room here for 2, 4, 6 more. So four times six is 24. So we've got to put four electrons on the central atom. Okay. So far, that's last chapter. Now, what do we get when we have one, two, three, four, five, six electron groups? What shape do you get? Octahedral. Yeah, you get ahead of yourself. <laughs> Octahedral electron geometry. Okay, so how do we get um, six equivalent orbitals? Well, five worked for the previous molecule. Six, we just need an extra D, don't we? We have D, two, S, P, three. Use two Ds. And xenon definitely has 
has room for those. Right, we have one, two, three, four, five. So five D is available. So we need um, D2 SP3s, we need six of them. And we really we only need uh, sigma orbitals, right? So you would have this square planar arrangement for the fluorine system with the xenon in the middle. And then right, so the bonds here would be D2SP3 uh, orbitals used to bond with fluorines, right? And then you would have uh, DSP3s, two extra ones for the lone pairs. And that would give you your symmetry. Okay, so what bond angles do we have? Well, let's see. Uh, 90 degrees, right? Four times 90 is 360. And uh, 90 degrees here. And then technically, 180 there. So I did get it in this one. I just didn't get it in the previous one. Okay. So that's what it would look like. Now, what do we do with um, hetero molecules? Do we need to make any significant changes to deal with HCN? That's, that's one, that's four, that's five, so that's uh, ten. That bonds. So carbon. Nitrogen, hydrogen, two, four, six. So where do they go? Well, we start from the outside and work our way in. Okay. So that means we can't do anything on this side, but we can move that one, that one like that. So that gives us like that with a lone pair. Okay. So this slide just asks you, um, how many sigma orbitals do we have? So we've got one over here and one over here, so there's two. And then there's a pi here and a pi here. So two sigmas and two pi's in the molecule. Um, and when we talk about sigmas and pi's, remember, we're actually talking about bonds. Lone pairs will count, because they're not bonded to anything. Um, so, just out of curiosity, what would the hybridization on this carbon be? It needs one on this side and one on that side, right? It only needs two orbitals, so it would be SP hybridized, right? How about nitrogen? Well, it needs uh, one on this side and one for its lone pair, so it would be SP hybridized. And that means with only SP hybridized, this one has two unused P's. This one has two unused P's to overlap and give you that, that pi and that pi. Okay. Probably need to sit down in the quiet of your study area. Go over these later. See if any of this sunk in. And then, of course, review the video. Okay. So now's a good time to sort of compile what we've learned. Okay. So let's see. How should I organize this? Let's say um, uh, electron groups in this column. So we can have two electron groups. We have three, and four, five, and six. So we ought to spread them out some more. No, it's okay. For, for this discussion, that's fine. That number of electron groups. 
Okay, so what's the electronic uh, geometry for each one of these? So if you have two, it's linear, right? right? For hybridization discussions, the electronic geometry is, is your target. Right? Then you can do molecular geometry after that. But we're trying to explain uh, using hybridization. Uh, what to deal with. Okay, so three would be trigonal planar, right? Four would be tetrahedral. Five would be trigonal, bipyramidal, and six would be octahedral. Okay, and the hybridization. Right. Hybridization for these. Well, um, if you only need two, that's SP. If you need three, that's SP3. If you need four, oh, excuse me, two. Four, you need SP3. Five, you need DSP. And six, you need two. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's really all we need for that chart. Then you can decide if these unused P's need to be used for something else. But as far as the hybridization goes, that's the explanation. If I were to say this molecule is sp3 hybridized, what's its geometry? Tetrahedral. Well, electronic geometry. Okay. Because if it were methane, both the same. If it were ammonia, it would be tetrahedral here, but you have a lone pair, so you have a trigonal pyramid. So you, you still can diverge for the molecular geometries depending on how many long pairs you have. Okay, uh, let's see. We did this one already. We did that one already. Um, this one's probably going to be the same as uh, xenon. No, that's difluoride. So we could do do these three. And so two. How about that one? Sulfur is going to have, what, six? And this is 12, 18. So we have uh, sulfur and then oxygen, right? That's two, four, and 14. Okay. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So around that sulfur, you have one, two, three groups. Right. So that's trigonal planar. So the hybridization is going to be sp2. Okay, and you're going to have, well, if we finish it, uh, we need uh, one, one, two, two, four, six, we need two more. So we would bring this one over here and make a double bond. But we could have brought it from the other side just as easily. Right? So what does that mean? Resonance, right? So you have to resonate these two. So if we just focus on sulfur, then we have um, one, two, three. We have two sigma bonds and one lone pair up here. So two sigmas plus one lone pair in that one. And then we have an unused P to overlap here and make that pi bond. Okay. Or if it were resonating, we flip it on the other side. 
Okay, so that's SO2. We already done that one. So the SO2, these are going to be uh, 120 degrees on the trigonal planer. Um, well, I gave that one away. But let's let's do it anyway. Krypton bifluoride. Okay, so Krypton has eight. Two times seven is fourteen, which is twenty-two electrons. Krypton in the middle, fluorine here, fluorine there. So it's two four minus four would be eighteen. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So two four six ten. 12, we've got six electrons left over. So two, four, six. All right, so around Krypton, let's see. Krypton is going to exceed the octet. Fluorine's already got its octet. So we didn't, don't need to move any lone pairs. I mean, they are where they are and they stay there. So around Krypton, we have one, two, three, four, five. Um, five electron groups, which means what? Trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal bipyramidal is ESP3. Okay. And if we draw out the structure, we get 90 degrees, 120 degrees, and 180 for the electronic geometry. If you're only talking about the um, molecular geometry, you're going to have these fluorines up here, down here, krypton in the middle, and then the lone pairs like that, right? So the, the uh, molecular geometry is linear right? because that's the best way to get all of the electrons distributed farthest away from each other and from the bonds themselves. Okay, so one more, ICL5. Okay, so that's uh, six times seven is 42 electrons. Yeah, an eye in the middle. One, two, three, four, five. Chlorine, 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 chlorine. Two, four, six, eight, ten, which is 32 electrons. And six around each one would only be 30, right? So we have two electrons left over. go on the central atom. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six groups, which means octahedral. And octahedral is D2SP3. Okay, so you're going to have uh, five equivalents bonded to chlorine, and then the sixth one is reserved for that lone pair. Well, that's carbon dioxide. There we go. 90 and 180 degrees. Okay. I'll leave that up there for a while until I need the space. That's a good reference. Okay, so this just summarizes what we've done. Um, last chapter was just up to here. This chapter includes hybridization as part of the discussion. So 
So these are the limitations on the localized electron model. Now, why, why are we discussing limitations on the localized electron model? It seems like it's coming around the corner. <clears throat> it's time to restrict the use of the localized electron model. We're not going to throw it out because it does solve many problems. <clears throat> But there are other problems that it doesn't solve. And we're going to restrict the localized electron model with its VSEPR and hybridization. And then we're going to move on to uh, molecular orbitals. So this is why the localized electron model doesn't solve all our problems. It, it assumes that all the electrons are localized. And in order to accommodate situations where they're not localized, and we have to recognize that they're not localized because, uh, for instance, um, ah, benzene. So we now know that benzene is a ring structure. So it's going to be like that, 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 that. And organic chemists, when we draw things like that, that's the carbon. If you don't write the carbon in, where two lines meet, get the carbon. All those are carbon. And then each one has a hydrogen. Okay, so there's all our molecules. But we don't have octets yet. So how do you get octets in there? Well, one way is to build one there, and then there, and then there. And that gives you octets for every atom in there, except for the hydrogens. It has to do that. But the problem with that is, and I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but um, that says that this bond is a different length and a different strength than that bond is. Because this one's double bond, that one's single. So it's only a sigma and a sigma and a pi. So this one ought to be shorter and stronger, right? but they're not. They're all equivalent. We know that the electron um, density is smeared over the entire molecule. A localized electron model can't handle that. Now we could do resonance, right? Do like that. Right? And just move the double bonds around like that. And that would be a valid localized electron model fix. Right? When you say, oh, it resonates back and forth. Well, that's why they all look like they're equal. But that's kind of hard to swallow. Okay, so um, we need a way to actually accommodate and allow us to calculate these uh, bond lengths and bond angles bond energies uh, without having to resort to these uh, fixes. Uh, unpaired electrons, it doesn't deal very effectively with those either. I mean, where do you put them? I tried to show you mostly situations where the unpaired electrons went into hybrid orbitals. That's, that kind of simplified things. But sometimes you don't have those available and the unpaired electrons have to go into unused P orbitals, for instance, right? So the localized electron model doesn't really account for that. It doesn't give you good instructions as to where they need to go. I just, I just put them where I thought they should go. So we need a model that will uh, tell us not where they should go because we're going to create a new, a completely new model. And with the molecular orbital theory, we're not saying the electrons belong to any atom. They belong to the molecule. It's kind of a, a collectivist attitude. You know, I shouldn't call it the communist model. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, 
And of course, it doesn't provide any direct information about bond energy. And the molecular orbital model does. Now, calculating those values is another issue. It's, the molecular orbital model is, uh, is a uh, mathematical probabilistic. Right? So the further you go, the more unreal it gets in my mind. Okay, so with our molecular orbital model, I will erase this one now. That, that's kind of a crutch, so we're going to get rid of the crutch. So the molecular orbital model says that the molecule um, is a collection of atoms with their individual nuclei and the electrons are uh, community property of the whole molecule. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to scrap atomic orbitals altogether and create a new set of molecular orbitals. Now, I said scrap, but the molecular orbitals are, we start with atomic orbitals and we generate molecular orbitals from their carcasses. Okay, they are consumed in the process. And all the electrons are assumed also to be delocalized. Right? They're not owned by any atom, they're not shared. Like I said before, they are community property. Now, we still keep the concept of sigma orbitals and pi orbitals. That's still a very useful concept, so we keep it. Only we modify the definition somewhat in order to make it more amenable to molecular orbital theory. Um, so, um, I put this in red because this just, this means that the number of molecular orbitals that come out of the process are the same number as atomic orbitals that come in. We do conserve the number of orbitals. Okay. So, simplest. Two protons, two hydrogen atoms. Right. So, this one hydrogen atom has an S orbital available. This one has an S orbital available. And we can do one of two things with them. The concept is called interference. Okay. Um, I may have asked you this before. Anybody here had physics? Okay. So you know the interference of light waves. Okay. I'll, I'll refresh your memory. Say we have one light wave that's represented by this sine wave, right? We have another light wave, and these presumably would be from, from lasers because they're collimated and they're coherent. Um, and we have another one that we want to combine with it. Like that. So what do we get out of that? Well, if you combine those two, you get something that looks like that constructive interference. In other words, these are lined up with the, uh, the hills and valleys, right? So they constructively interfere, they add to one another, right? But if you had one in here like this, and you add these two together, what do you get? Destructive interference, right? This one's going that way, that one's going that way, and when you add them together, you get zero. Right. So that concept is one that we carry over into the molecular orbital theory. So the co combination can be constructive, or it can be destructive. Interference. 
So I said that so that this won't seem so foreign. When we combine the profiles of these two constructively, we get a bonding molecular orbital. In other words, we increase the, the strength, we actually decrease the energy, right? Because lower energy means uh, more stable. But if we destructively combine these two, we get an anti-bonding molecular orbital. And the anti-bonding molecular orbitals in this representation shows us that um, we've got a nucleus over here and a nucleus over there, hydrogen nucleus here and here, that are bound by the most probable electron density is in between them on axis. But the anti-bonding, the most probable density would be out here, away from them. And that leaves a node in the middle. That's why we call it anti-bonding, because there's a node between them, which means the electron density is non-existent. And that is what um, uh, makes this an anti-bonding orbital. In other words, it doesn't, in fact, it subtracts from the ability to bond. And I'm going to, we're going to actually calculate using bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, we're going to calculate the strength of bond, relative strengths of the bonds. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, bond order. So just put that back here for a second. We'll get to it in a minute. But first to introduce the concept of bonding versus anti-bonding. And what does that mean? Well, if this one comes in with an orbital and that one comes in with an orbital, you end up with one, two orbitals, right? So we've conserved the atomic orbitals in the molecular orbital numbers. Right? That's how we do it, creating bonding and antibonding, right? If we didn't do that, then we'd have to have two bonding orbitals and that would just, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't allow us to explain anything about the molecules if we didn't use this concept, constructive versus destructive interference. Uh, okay, so uh, they're referring M1 and MO2, molecular orbital one, molecular orbital two, let me go back. So molecular orbital one is the bonding, MO2 is the antibody. Okay. So this is the bonding, gives you a lower energy, which means more stable. MO2 is higher energy, which means less stable. Okay. So this is the way we diagram bonding versus anti-bonding in the formation of molecular orbitals. Okay. So we have, um, on this scale, we have energy. That's energy. And the general way to deal with it is to, you put your atoms on the outside and then you, you take their atomic orbitals and you produce molecular orbitals in the middle. Because in the middle, that's where they're both together. Okay. So in this case, we have, uh, we have the, uh, the 1s orbitals, orbital for this hydrogen. And we have this hydrogen also has a 1s orbital. Okay? And when we mix them, combine them, we get one at a higher energy level, and we get one at a lower energy level. Okay? So this is the, um, the these are both, no, no, sigmas. Sigmas. This one is the lower energy, so it's the bonding orbital, right? So the bonding came from 1s on either side. This one came from 1s also, but it's anti-bonding. And the convention is for anti-bonding is to use an asterisk. So 
less bonding, that's anti-bonding in terms of energy level. We start off with two, we end up with two. So this is our molecular orbital set. Now, electrons, where do the electrons go? Well, they came from here, right? One there, one there. And we use, um, I think it's Hun's rule. You fill it up, lowest energy first, moving to higher energy. So this one goes in here, this one goes in here, has to have an opposite spin. So presumably, it flips on the way. So both of the, uh, every orbital that we create has room for two electrons. Right? So we put both of them in this one. That means electrons are only in the bonding orbital. Okay, so that explains the, the strength of the bond because we don't have any anti-bonding electrons fighting it. Okay. So for argument's sake, <clears throat> what if we pr produce this um, diatomic hydrogen and we uh, add an electron, right? So what if we did this? Now it has three. Doesn't matter which one you start with. So we have three there. Then where does the third one go? It has to go up there. Right? So now you've got these two that you started with plus that one up there, which tends to destabilize the molecule because this is antibody versus bond. Okay. I'm trying to ease into discussion of bond order. Okay. Um, the, the labels here tell us whether it's on axis or off axis, right? On axis would be sigma, off axis would be pi's. Okay. And then the asterisk tells us whether it's um, bonding or antibonding. Just start from the lab. Uh, I think we're making pretty good progress. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll be okay. So, how would we write? I shouldn't have erased that. <clears throat> but hydrogen's easy. So how would we write the electronic configuration for this dihydrogen? Well, it's lowest energy on the left, higher energy as you go. Okay. So we would have this, um, we would have this sigma from a 1s, and we would have the antibonding sigma from 1s. And then this would have two electrons in it, and that would have none. So actually, we don't even have to write that. That would be the molecular orbital electronic configuration for this molecule. Okay. If you only have atoms, then you just write the electronic configuration like we used to. Right? But once you have a molecule, with this theory, you write it in terms of molecular orbitals. So that's a sigma orbital with two electrons in it, and it was created from the 1s. Now, if you happen, it's possible to create a sigma from two different types of orbitals, right? In that case, you would put in whatever they happen to be, say from a 1s and a 2p. Well, that would give you the origins, the atomic orbit. And orbitals. S orbital has a spherical shape. S orbitals on different atoms can combine to form molecular orbitals. As two hydrogen. It's a spherical shape. I accidentally hit the button. Uh, okay. I 
just want to be sure I'm not skipping over any points. So we can't do anything else. The orbital has a spherical shape. S orbitals on different atoms can combine to form molecular orbitals. As two hydrogen 1s orbitals approach one another, the orbitals combine with an increased electron density between the atoms. The result is a sigma bonding orbital. S orbitals on different atoms can also combine by subtracting the two 1s orbitals. A decrease in the electron density between the atoms is observed, resulting in the formation of a sigma antibonding molecular orbital. An S orbital has a spherical shape. S orbitals on different atoms can combine to form molecular orbitals. As He's just going to keep talking. I, I must have put it in the loop <laughs> inadvertently. Um, he also misspoke when he said um, the combination of the orbitals was observed. It wasn't observed. It's theoretical, completely theoretical. Now, some observations support the theory, but it's not a direct observation. You don't observe these orbitals directly. You get the information from uh, from the same places that we got information for the localized electron model, but now that information makes more sense because we can combine it in a new model that explains uh, the observations better. Now for bond order, I should have left that up there. Let me just redraw it. These are our two hydrogens, and they produce molecular orbitals. The uh, sigma star of an S and the sigma of an S start off with these two electrons. They go in here. Now, what's the bond order of this molecule? You add the number of bonding electrons. And then you subtract the number of antibonding electrons and divide by two. So we've got two minus zero okay, divided by two equals one. So the bond order for this one is one. Okay. Now the temptation is to say, oh, one, that means a single bond. Well, that means single bond. The problem with that is you can calculate bond orders that are fractional. Right? So what do you do with those? So it, it's useful sometimes to think of uh, bond order one is a, it's a single bond, bond order two is a double bond, bond order three is a triple bond, and that holds pretty good. But just recognize that you can have fractions in between. For instance, this one, All right? So what would that one be? Now we have two down here and one up there. Divided by two is one half. That's my bond order. Okay. Now, what does bond order mean? Well, if you compare molecules, or if you say you compare the H two with no charge to this H2, what can we say we can derive, not derive, uh, we can, well, yeah, I guess derive. We can derive um, which one is the more stable molecule. So the one that has a bond order of one is more stable than the one that has one half. So the higher the bond order, the more stable the bond, or the more stable the molecule, actually, because all of this is in terms of the whole molecule. So that's another advantage. Um, with the localized electron model, we could really only talk about stability of individual bonds. But with the molecular orbital theory, we can say something about the entire molecule. So if we have this molecule over here, and we change it to this one over here, we do bond order on each one. 
the one with a higher bond order is the more stable. And that can help us decide which one is a better representation of the molecule too. You know, all everything else being equal. Okay, so that calculation is really simple. The hard part is doing this, because in order to use that calculation, you need to know how many electrons are in bonding versus anti-bonding order. So the bigger the molecule gets, the more difficult it is. So we're not going to get real complicated here because I'm not trying to turn you guys into chemists. Lord knows I'm not one either. I'm a backdoor chemist. I didn't get a chemistry degree. I just picked up chemistry along the way to help me understand other things. So I'm a practical chemist. I like that term better. <clears throat> okay. So there's your calculation for bond order for H2. And this is what would happen if we charged it. Right? What would happen if we went the other way? Did you have one of those? Let's just see what would happen. Okay. We did that. We only have one there. So that would be one minus zero divided by two would be one half. So you go either way, either add an electron or subtract an electron, and you destabilize the molecule. Now that's true for H2. Okay. But for some molecules, adding an electron can stabilize it. Why? Because that electron might go into a bonding orbital. If the extra electron goes into a bonding orbital, you're stabilizing it. So uh, examples of that would be some of the polyatomics. You know, they're ions. And if you look at um, NO3, without the extra electron, it's less stable than the NO3 minus. Just a heads up. I didn't want you to assume that just adding an electron or subtracting an electron would destabilize. It depends on where the electrons go, where they come from. Okay. Um, these molecules, uh, the easiest ones to understand are the homonuclear diatoms. That is, you've got the same atom on either side going in because you're starting at the same energy level, so it's, it's easier to construct the molecular orbitals using the homonucleus. The two identical atoms coming together. When two 2p two orbitals are aligned sideways and added, a pi bonding molecular orbital is formed. When two 2p two orbitals are aligned sideways and subtracted, a pi anti bonding molecular orbital is formed. Okay. So we probably ought to do, actually it would be better if we did a one that was a little more complicated. Uh, let's dig into, how about, how about oxygen? Okay. Yeah, let's do oxygen. I'll try to do oxygen. Ah. Okay. There we go. So, what does oxygen look like for it? Atomic structure because you have to start from there before you can make the molecular orbital. So oxygen is going to have eight electrons. So we've got um, a 1s, we've got a uh, 2s, and we've got uh, two p's, right? Get 
three of them, X, Y, and Z. I hope I do that so I can deal with it. Maybe I'll spread it out a little bit more. Now let's put our electrons in there. We've got eight here. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Same for this side. Okay. Now what do we do with these orbitals? Well, these are going to combine to make a sigma 1s and a sigma star. Yes. This is going to make a 2s sigma, and this one's going to make a sigma star 2s. You get kind of messy in here. Now, how many sigmas can you make? You can only make one sigma. So, uh, I'll be sure I want to put them in the right place. Yeah. So you can have a, a sigma from a 2p. And you can have a um, sigma star, 2p. Okay. Okay, then what do we do with the rest of them? Well, the rest of them we have to make pi orbitals, pi molecular orbitals. Can only have one sigma. That's that's kind of a holdover from uh, the localized electron model, where you can only have one sigma because it's on axis, and the pi orbitals are all off axis. So you can really only have one of those, even in molecular orbital. So we can have two um, pi two p's, right? And then you can have pi star. From 2p. Okay, so that puts the sigma and the sigma stars opposite ends and the pi is in the middle. That's what we would normally predict. And oxygen obeys that. And I'll, I'll explain why I'm doing it that, that way in a minute. Okay, let's see if we have the right number of orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, ten. One, two, three. So we've conserved our orbitals and we've produced uh, the same number of antibonding as bonding. Right? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now we need to put our electrons in. Right? So we've got two, four, six, eight, sixteen. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Notice how I pair. I've got the same energy level, so i got to put one in here and one in there first before I can come back and pair them. Okay, so we've used up all of our electrons. Now let's do bond order. So how many, how many bondings do we have? Well, let's say we've got two. Four, six, eight, ten. And the antibonds. We have two, four, six, right? Six. So that's four divided by two is two.
So we can infer, as long as we understand what we're doing, infer bond order two double bond between us. So that would be our Lewis dot structure corresponding to this double bond order. Okay, <clears throat> now <clears throat> when we're doing, when you're drawing these molecular orbital constructions, um, you can leave out the nonvalence electrons because they're really not involved. I mean, they are involved, but for our purposes, um, they will not affect the construction here, the input of the electrons, or the calculation of the bond order. It's just that when you do that, be sure that when you start filling electrons, don't use all of them, right? <laughs> Recognize that these two and those two are not part of your energy diagram anymore. So if you if you keep that rule in mind, then you can you can just do the valence electrons as part of your structure. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to come back to uh, to that in just a minute. Paramagnetism, diamagnetism. No, I'm not. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. So what do we mean by paramagnetism and diamagnetism are observed phenomena? In other words, um, a paramagnetic material is attracted into a magnetic field, whereas a diamagnetic is not attracted or repelled from the magnetic field. You can measure those values using this device. So we, we suspend using a, a very sensitive balance suspend our sample into this magnetic field and you can detect as it approaches whether it's being pulled or not being pulled or even repelled on that balance, okay? So why is that? Well, the, the theory says that anytime you have unpaired electrons, they tend to generate their own magnetic field and they do it in, in the opposite direction to the induced magnetic field from the outside. But the inducing magnetic field from the outside. So when that happens, um, uh, the magnetic field's going one way, the molecules got an unpaired electron going the other way and they attract. If you have all paired electrons, as in nitrogen, then you don't get that induced magnetic field. So you don't get the attraction. So here's where it comes from. For oxygen, that's unpaired and that's unpaired. Even though they're in anti-bonding orbitals, they're still there and they're still unpaired. So that's why oxygen is paramagnetic. It is attracted into a magnetic field. Now, I don't have a video of this, but um, you're seeing, well, you know what a horseshoe magnet looks like. Right? They make them really big, huge horseshoe magnet. Right. So you have this massive magnetic field in here. You take liquid oxygen and pour it into that space, it'll fill up. Oxygen is just sit right there in that space until it turns to gas and leaves. But as long as it's liquid, um, it, it, it maintains its volume, right, like all liquids do. And the magnetic field confines it into a space, kind of like a jar, a magnetic jar. It holds the oxygen there. But nitrogen, you pour nitrogen in there, it goes right on through. That means stop. Because nitrogen has all paired electrons in its structure. Um, now, the reason we spend so much time explaining these things is 
when we draw these molecular orbital pictures, the energy diagrams, they have to agree with the observed phenomenon. If we draw this one for nitrogen with that form, nitrogen would be uh, two less electrons. Actually, hold on a second, let me do some mental gymnastics. All right, so nitrogen is not a good example. <clears throat> This electronic diagram for nitrogen um, produces that effect because they're all paired. But in some cases, we have those that um, if we use this diagram, they are uh, diamagnetic. But this diagram would show them to be unpaired. So that causes us to want to move the positions of these around so that we can get the pair electron structure and match with the observation. Okay, and that brings us to the topic of SP mixing. Um, so, in my mind, SP mixing is another is a, a fix on the molecular orbital theory to account for observed behaviors. Um, and here we go. Okay, so let me see if I can help you make sense of this diagram. What we would expect for oxygen is this one, right? For the sigma down here and the sigma star up here, opposite one another. And the pi's and the pi stars in the middle, okay? That will only happen if the energy of the S and the P orbitals that go into making those molecular orbitals are far enough apart so that they don't interact. If you can keep them far enough apart, atomic orbital energy is going in, then the molecular orbitals assume this configuration where the sigma star is high, sigma is low, and the pi's are in between. When the S's and P's are close enough together that they start to mix, then they produce uh, the effect where you flip um, this sigma with this pi. I think I said that right. Right, that puts That puts the pi energy level below the sigma energy level when it's produced from uh, p orbitals. Right? So anything from nitrogen over back here, the s's and p's are close enough in energy so that they mix and they produce that effect. But from oxygen over, they're far enough apart where you get this arrangement. I got another diagram. This one actually came out of your book, I think. So these experience SP mixing. So we get, here we go, there. When there's no SP mixing, the pi orbitals are in the middle. Right? So you get the pi here, pi star, and the pi here in the middle. And the, and the sigmas are outriggers. But when there's mixing, you get the pi first, then the sigma, and then the pi star, then the sigma star. So the sigma star stays put, the pi star stays put, and you just flip the s, the, the sigma, and the pi. Okay. See the difference there? 
These are mixed. These are not mixed. And because it's, it's such a headache, I know, um, you should find one or more of those in the review document. Yeah. Okay. So, in keeping with my history, if it's in the review document, it'll be on the test. So you'll have those diagrams available to you in the test. So if you forget how the mixing goes, it's right there. Okay. Um, let's see if I can find an example. Um, if we were to use boron without mixing, these two would go into this sigma orbital instead of these two pi's. That would pair the electrons. If we use this model for boron, you would get diamagnetism. But we observe boron as being paramagnetic. That was the point I was trying to make earlier. Nitrogen wouldn't behave for me. <clears throat> but boron, yes. Uh, with sp mixing, then we can explain why boron is paramagnetic. Um, if we had uh, carbon, dicarbon, using the no sp mixing model, then these four would have to go two here and then two there. And that would make uh, boron uh, paramagnetic instead of diamagnetic, okay? So the point of this long-winded explanation is um, the theory has to agree, agree with observed phenomena. It's not the other way around. We don't get to make a theory and then force nature into it. So the theory has to explain nature as it is. And that's why some of these changes are made a major driving force for producing new theories or major modifications to the theory, to make them agree with reality. Okay, so what do we do with heteronuclear molecules? Right. All the nuclears, of course, have the same atom on either side. Heteronuclears will have two different atoms. So for our example here, carbon monoxide, so we've got carbon and an oxygen together rather than the N2. Now, carbon monoxide is isoelectronic with N2. In other words, it has the same number of electrons and presumably in a similar atomic electronic structure. But the carbon monoxide produces an entirely different molecular orbital structure. That's why I just put it on there so I wouldn't have to draw it out. But if we start with carbon on this side, and actually, that's a mistake. That should be 2s. Because we're, we're using the only the valence electrons. Right? So we don't want 1s in carbon. Right? Carbon we want only the second period, uh, n equal 2. So that needs to be, the only reason I put this in here is because rebuilding that graphic would be a real pain. <laughs> so I'll just make a point of the fact that the authors made a mistake. Okay. <clears throat> so if we've got uh, four electrons here for the carbon, and we've got uh, two, four, six on this side, the oxygen, and then we draw this diagram. So we have the, the sigma and the sigma and pi and the sigma star. So it looks to me like we have the pi's would be together. So this looks like we have uh, mixing. Carbon and oxygen are close enough together. Oxygen, dioxygen, right, would be no mixing. Dicarbon would be mixing. So we have to see which one wins. And as it turns out, according to the experts, the mixing wins. So we have a, a mixing arrangement here of the 
sigma c pi z. We would normally expect this sigma, uh, well, it would be up there, but these two, uh, these two would be flipped. No, these two would be flipped. Excuse me. Actually, that's not, that shouldn't be a sigma c pi. Should be. No, that's another error. I, never, I didn't notice that before. Let me make a note for myself. Another correction. So that sigma s star right there should be a sigma s. Right? Because we've got this sigma star, but where is the sigma down here? Back, that should be a sigma s. No, excuse me, it's being constructed from a p, excuse me. Right. So that's true. That's a sigma p, but this one should be. Why is it a sigma s? Should be sigma s. Well, maybe that's not a mistake. Hold on a second. Sigma bonding, bonding, bonding. Okay. That's why I didn't try to do it myself, because I would have messed it up. Okay, so um, let's see if we have the same number of orbitals. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, One, two, three, four five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, we're good. We have the same number of molecular orbitals. So what's the point of this? Well, the point is the carbon atom is starting, these are starting at higher energies than the oxygen atom. So when they mix, um, it's beyond me how to determine what the molecular orbital is. I would have to be given this one. My guess is that chemistry majors would have had to master that technique producing that stuff from scratch. Uh, another heteronuclear, HF, this might be easier to deal with. Right. So um, the only electron available for bonding from fluorine is in the P orbital. Right. So you've got one P, you've got two other P's with electrons, but they're not involved in the bonding. So that's why we've only got one up there. And then we've got one here. And that's why HF, has a bond order of one. Two minus zero divided by two. Uh, now, I'm not sure if the theory explains why the density is, is shifted more towards fluorine. Maybe the, uh, because the electron density is supposedly spread out over everybody. Okay. So can we say that the density is more towards fluorine? Molecular orbital probably doesn't need to do anything about that. Okay. Electronegativity tells you the answer for that. Uh, Let's back up. What does it look like? Okay. I'm going to throw this out. Plausible explanation. Why the electron density is closer to fluorine. Because the sigma orbital is closer to the parent of fluorine than it is to hydrogen. Right? The energy difference here is much less than it is here. Right? So that Presumably, and perhaps even you could calculate, if I were competent with this stuff, you could calculate uh, how much the shift would be toward fluorine because the sigma orbital is closer to its parent P than it is to the S parent from hydrogen. That's a plausible explanation. OK. 
Okay, delocalization. Um, this concept is used to describe those molecules that require um, resonance in the localized electron model. So um, what we do is with the, particularly with the pi bond, we smear the electrons over the entire molecule. And since they're formed from uh, unused p orbitals, as we would explain in the localized electron model, then they're, they're uh, off axis. In other words, they're above and below the plane of the molecule. Oh, and they're going to use my example. Benzene. That's a perfect example. So we get these, um, that if we go back to our hybridization model, then uh, we see that we have these unused p orbitals that can be, that can overlap and form the pi bond. And that delocalization, which can be easily explained in molecular orbitals, if we just, uh, if we had time and energy and, and need to describe them. The, the smearing uh, is over the entire molecule. And in fact, when this happens, um, and I just lost the term. Uh, when this happens, we get what we call um, aromatic molecules. And aromatics are very stable, and they're stable for that reason. Uh, benzene is an aromatic molecule, and there are a host of others. Um, and in organic chemistry, we, we have some metal gymnastics and calculations you can do to determine if this molecule is aromatic and that molecule is not. But it, it all goes back to uh, this concept of delocalization. Right? If you can spread those molecules, those uh, the electron density out evenly over the molecule like that, you tend to stabilize it. Delocalization, just think of this. When you hear delocalization, just automatically think stable. The P orbitals used to form the pi bonds of the nitrate ion overlap with one another to provide a delocalization of the electrons over the entire ion. Okay. So that goes back to our polyatomics. And I would be willing to bet that sulfate has a similar delocalization. Uh, carbonate would have a similar delocalization that stabilizes the molecule. And all we'd have to do is, is uh, take the formula and draw out the Lewis structure. And then be difficult for me to draw the molecular orbital model, but we can still get an idea from the delocalization um, concept uh, that it would stabilize the molecule. Now this one, this slide, I just threw in there. It, I actually, it's part of the author's creation. Uh, but the photoelectron spectroscopy is a, a way of actually uh, determining whether your molecular orbital model is consistent with the data. This is the data, right? And these are the molecular orbitals to which these values are assigned. So you get a, a, uh, a spectrum or peaks that when once calibrated, you can say these this peak is at this much energy and this one's in this this one's and you can align those with your molecular orbital model. And if it doesn't match up, then you go back to the drawing board and try a different one. But uh, my my assumption is that this is the way that they determine whether or not you've got uh, SP mix got SP mixing, then you better line up with this spectroscopy.
sounds to me like it's a very specialized technique. You, you were a researcher in that. Even though you knew how to operate the equipment, you probably didn't have time to do it because it was very tedious. So you, you hire a research assistant to do it. I wouldn't even trust it with graduate students because they're not there long enough. You need somebody that's there, going to stay there, learn the equipment, learn how to use it. And they would supervise graduate students' use of the equipment. That's generally how it goes. Okay, that's it for this. And you've got uh, two weeks before we do the review. So you've got a chance to, to go through here and, and uh, you can contact me during the break if you want, if you have a question. Um, I'll still, even if I'm at home, I'll have my, I'll have my link. If you send me an email, I'll get it and I can respond. Nobody else showed up. Well, at least I got it recorded. <laughs>